you can go out and do the work the way it will please you. Let everyone without exception be fruitful. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Another amen before you sit down. God bless you. We're coming to 1 Samuel chapter 16. I will read him from verse 7. 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance, or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him, rejected him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. The Lord looketh on the heart. As we look at that statement, and God makes a statement, an important statement, concerning men and concerning himself, and concerning the way he evaluates man, you will see that God said he looks on the heart. Most men, most ministers will praise men because of what you see outwardly. Blame men because of what they see outwardly. They may approve or disapprove. They may reward or rebuke others. But it's always on the basis of outward action or outward behavior. Without thinking of the state of the heart, the condition of the heart, the motive in the heart, the intention of the heart. But God says it's different. Of course it will be different. Because it's God. He knows the heart of all men and of all women. And he evaluates on the basis of the motive from the heart. On the basis of the thoughts in the heart. On the basis of the intention that the man, the woman, the person has. The state or the condition of the heart is very important to God. It is actually the heart that determines the value and the worth of all the actions of men. As we look at an action, you cannot just say, that's good, that's praiseworthy, that's wonderful, that's rewardable. You must uh, look at the intention behind that action. You might uh, say that somebody speaks well. What's behind what is speaking? Somebody gives something. What's the heart behind the giving? And that's what the Lord is telling us, seemingly good actions are evil and reprovable if they proceed from evil intentions and a particular heart. That is, somebody has an action that appears good, seemingly good, seemingly acceptable, and seemingly praiseworthy. Yet, if the intention is evil, and if the heart is hypocritical in doing that, all that will not be acceptable or accepted in the word by the sight, in the sight of the Lord. Look at that verse 7 again. It says, but the Lord said unto Samuel. Samuel was a prophet of God. We are preachers and we are pastors and we are leaders and workers. And here Samuel was commending Eliab. And he was saying, here is the appointed of the Lord before me. And God says, Samuel, you know what? You're judging by the outward posture. You're judging by the outward stature. You're judging by the outward beauty. You're judging by the outward appearance. I've rejected him. I've refused him. Because I'm not looking at something external. I'm looking at the heart of the man. And that's when God now reveals to us. He says, man, look at on the outward appearance, outward expression, outward behavior, outward stature, outward uh, pro uh, propensities. But the Lord looks on the heart. If you look at Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10. We're reading from verse 2. I might uh, back up to verse 1, but I need verse 2 first. In verse 2 it says, Their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. 
you see that's the heart somebody is doing something by repeated practice a person may do the right thing a person might be able to say the right thing but then the heart if the heart is divided not fully for god not fully for righteousness not wholly based on the principle of holiness his heart is divided and whatever he does it might by reflex action that is by a general practice he might be saying the right thing doing the right thing looking the right way but his heart is divided and therefore he will be found faulty look at verse 1 Israel is an empty vine because the heart is divided the heart, it says, is not an empty vine. He bringeth forth fruit unto himself. It's not that he's not bearing fruit, but he's bringing the fruit unto himself. And God says, I'm looking at that. It's not consecrated to me. It's not committed to me. It's not given to me. It's bearing the fruit for himself. It says, according to the multitude of the fruit, as he increased the altars, according to the goodness of his land, they have made goodly images. That is, uh, even as we look at the fruit around, it's like everything is good, everything is fruitful. But I look at the heart of the man, I look at the heart of the woman, and it says now in verse 2, their heart is divided. Now shall they be found faulty. It shall break down their altars. It shall spoil their images. For now they shall say, we have no king. You see the division of the, in their heart? They say, we have no king. They are lost unto themselves. And they do whatever they want, anytime they want to do it, and yet they are still bringing forth fruit. And the fruit they are bringing forth is to themselves. And it says, because we feared not the Lord. Well, they are not even taking, bringing God into the equation of their lives. And they are not thinking about what God will say about this, what God will say about that. They feared not the Lord. What then should, uh, what then should a king do to us? That is, they respected no authority, either the authority from heaven or the authority here on earth. Either the king of kings or the kings here on earth, they respected no one. They looked up to no one. They accepted no challenge or no instruction from anyone. And they said they are bringing forth fruit. All the fruit they are bringing forth is to themselves. And then God said, their heart is divided. I can't trust them. I can't depend on them. They are not serving me. And they don't fear me, they don't honor me or respect me. And they don't respect even any earthly authority. Tonight we are talking about the heart. And the topic is the heart that determines destiny. It's not the work of our hand, the heart. It's not the feet where we go, it's the heart. It's not the mouth, what we say only is the heart. It's not the sacrifice we give, it's the heart. It's the motive in the heart, the intention in the heart. The heart that determines destiny. We're coming to Proverbs chapter 4. And I'm reading from verse 23. Proverbs chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 3. The heart is very important, very essential. And the condition of the heart is something you need to think about. In Proverbs chapter 4 verse 23, it says, Keep thy heart with all diligence. It says, if you are going to keep anything at all, keep your heart. If you are watching over anything at all, watch over your heart. And if you are taking care of anything at all, take care of that heart. And if you're improving anything at all, the first thing to improve is that heart. It says in that verse 23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. You see that? Out of it are the issues of life. The heart is the fountain of all actions. If the fountain, if the source is good, the outcome, what comes out, will be good. The stream is only as good as the spring from which that stream came. That is the stream of water coming from a particular source. That stream of water will be good if the source is good. If the fountain is good. If the spring is good. None of us shall be satisfied 
with only outward correctness. None of us should be satisfied with only outward righteousness. Holiness in the heart, resulting in holiness of life, is necessary before anyone can see God in heaven. Keep your heart then with all diligence, because out of that heart proceeds the issues of life. That's similar to what Jesus said. Look at the way Jesus put it. It tells us the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 33. Matthew chapter 12, verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the, fruit, make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. O generation of vipers, how can ye be evil? Evil at heart, how can ye be evil? Evil in the source, how can ye be evil? Evil at the very fountain, how can ye be evil? Evil in the heart, how can you be evil? Bring forth, speak good things. For out of the abundance of, tell me, of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. That means the Lord is looking at the heart. And it is the condition of the heart that determines what we're going to be, where we're going to be, who we're going to be in eternity. You see the Pharisees and the Sadducees, eh, they were very careful and diligent about their outward expression. You know, the places they went, the things they washed and this and that. But their heart was not right with God. In Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23, I'm reading from verse 27. Matthew chapter 23, verse 27, Warn to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye are like the white sepulchres, which indeed, which truly, as we look at those sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. You see, the people of the world, they can have the switch in their heart. They can have the corruption in their heart. They can have the stinking kind of material inside their heart, and cover it up with a slab. And cover it up with, uh, you know, something so concrete that the odor may not come out, the stench may not come out. But it says the heart is full of all of dead men's bones of a long keenness. Even so, even so, in verse 28, ye also appear outwardly righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. So the condition of the heart is very important. That's why it says in verse 33, ye serpents, ye generation of vipers, how can ye escape? How can you escape the damnation of hell? It's been very clear as we read those few verses of scripture that the heart is very important and the heart must be cleansed, the heart must be circumcised, the heart must be purified, the heart must be purged before we can see the Lord up yonder. The topic again, the heart that determines destiny. It's not what you say alone, the heart. It's not the action of your hands alone, the heart. And it is not the fruit you are bearing alone, the heart. It's not the outward thing everybody can praise, everybody can appreciate. It's the heart. The heart that determines destiny. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the depravity of corrupt, condemned hearts. Hearts, corrupt. Hearts, condemned. The depravity. The depravity of corrupt, condemned hearts. Point number two. The decision of convicted, contrite hearts. The word of God comes to you. And when that word comes, it brings conviction to the heart. And it brings uh, a kind of a contrite heart. 
that leads you to Calvary, drives you to Calvary. And then you make confession of your sin and you pour everything out and because of the contrition of heart and because of the conviction in the heart, conversion eventually comes. Point number two, the decision of convicted, contrite hearts. Point number three, the destiny of cleansed, circumcised hearts. The destiny of cleansed, circumcised hearts. I'm sure you have number one. I said I'm sure you have number one. What's number one then? The depravity of corrupt, condemned hearts. It's very important for every one of us. As we're preaching salvation, as we're leading people to the Lord, remember, remember, we're not just talking about their actions. There may be people that will say, I've never smoked in my life, I've never drunk in my life, I've never done this in my life, I've never done that in my life. That's not the issue. That's not the problem. The real major problem is the heart of man. Because uh, we're talking about, look at Genesis chapter 6, we're reading from verse 5. Genesis chapter 6, reading from verse 5. We're going back to the very beginning because this is where the problem actually started. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, and God saw, and God saw, and God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. And that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart, look at that, every imagination of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Look at that verse very well. This is after the fall of Adam. This is after the sin of Adam and Eve. This is after Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden. This is after they lost the image of God, they lost the likeness of God, and now sin was in their nature. And as they came out of the Garden in chapter 3, driven out in chapter 4, um, Cain and Abel were giving back to him and all the other people that were coming and how here is the heart of all the men, of all the women that were born into the world after the uh, fall of man. It, uh, as you look at uh, you know, what it was at that time, you will see that everybody now had the nature of Adam and the nature of Eve. And that is a problem people still have today because the likeness of God, all that is gone. Because uh, the nature of God, all that is gone. And it tells us in that verse 5, it says God saw the wickedness of man, that it was great in the earth. And then it says every imagination you see, that's in word, that's internal. Every imagination, and then it says, of the thoughts, that's still there, is that the internal, of his heart was evil, not only that, only evil, not only that, only evil continually. And because they became corrupt, look at verse 11, the earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And the violence was because of the state of the heart, the condition of the heart, and the propensities of the heart, the depravity of the heart. And this was the result that everything was now corrupt. In verse 12, it says, And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was, what's the word there? Corrupt for how many people? All flesh had corrupted its way upon the earth. It's the depravity of the heart. When we talk about being depraved, to be depraved is to be debased. Is to be degenerate. Depraved, that means to be perverse. Depraved, that means to be perverted. That means to be reprobate, unclean, corrupt, debauched. Since the time of Adam, after the fall, everyone was born into the world with a depraved heart, a sinful heart, a corrupt heart, and a heart that didn't have the tendency or the pull or the desire to do right, except, of course, Christ, who came to be our Savior. He was sinless. He was perfect. He was spotless, the spotless, sinless Son of God. Until genuine conversion through Christ 
takes place, man lives with a depraved, corrupt heart. His head may be well informed through education, but it's not the problem of the head, it's the problem of the heart. His hands may be dexterous in doing something because the heart has been trained. Because of that training, he may appear to be doing something well through exercise, but that improvement will not change the heart. The heart must still receive a touch from the Lord, a transformation from the Lord, a cleansing from the Lord before anything good will come out of that man. The deformity in the heart and the dirt in the heart and the evil in the heart will take over the life of the man. He cannot do right because he's depraved. Look at Psalm 53. The condition of everyone that lives in the world until they meet Christ, before they meet Christ, because of that depravity in their heart. In Psalm 53, I'm reading from verse 1. Psalm 53, verse 1, the fool has said, where? In his heart. He lives as if there were no God. And it is part of the depravity of the heart that to deny the existence of God, that to deny the control of God, that to deny the authority of God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God, corrupt are they. And they have done abominable iniquity. There is none that doeth good. All have seen that come short of the glory of God. God looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand, that did see God. Every one of them is gone back. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. Tell me the rest. No, not one. No, not one. No, not one. It might appear they are doing some good as you look at, you know, your environment, your community. This is being built and this coming up and this coming up. But the heart is still not transformed. The heart is still corrupt. And the heart is still evil. And the heart is still sinful. The heart is debased. Actually, Jeremiah 17. Jeremiah 17, reading from verse 9. Here God again is telling us about the condition of the heart. And he says the problem of man is not, uh, you know, only what he says with the mouth. And only what he does with the hand. Only the places he goes with his feet. The problem of man is actually in his heart. It tells us in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things. Above all things, above the mouth, the heart is deceitful. Above the, you know, the posture, above the drama, above the acting is the heart. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It's so wicked that even man, having that depraved heart, cannot know, cannot tell how depraved that heart is. It says in verse 10, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give to every man as his ways, according to his ways, and according as the fruit of his doing. We have problem in the heart. Isaiah chapter 48. Isaiah chapter 48. First of all, we're reading from verse 4. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 4, because I knew that thou art obstinate, and thy neck is an iron sinew. And thy brow brass. It says, I knew, I knew. When did they become like that? Look at verse 8. Ye, thou hardest not, ye. Thou knewest not, ye. From that time that thine ear was not opened. For I knew, I knew, I knew that thou wouldest deal very treacherously. And was called a transgressor. When? From the womb from the womb, because the nature, the nature of evil was there, even from the womb, when a child is born. You can see as a child, even before the child begins to know how to talk and how to demand anything, you'll see selfishness there. 
you see that child you see the depraved nature coming out the anger coming out and the selfishness coming out and the demand coming out everybody everyone must serve that child and if that child is not having his way you know that's crying and crying and crying the nature was there and it says the heart has been depraved even from birth it is is a very strong word in Zechariah chapter 7. Zechariah chapter 7, reading from verse 12, a very strong word for the condition of the heart, for the state of the heart before we come to Christ. In Zechariah chapter 7, verse, tell me, verse 12. Please open your Bible. Yea, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. Adamant's hard, tough, resistant, stubborn, and will not hear the word of God. He said, that's the condition of their heart. The depravity becomes a well-established and well-hardened and will not go in the direction of the way of God. These are unbelievers. These are people that have not met Christ. And when you have not met Christ, you know, there are people that will say, you know, I trust myself. Once I make up my mind and I say, I'm not going to greet that person, no matter what happens. Even if I'm going to lose millions, it doesn't matter to me. I've made up my mind. That's what we're talking about. There's some people that will say, I've made up my mind. It's not just your mind, it's your heart. And once I say this, that's final. When I say good night, I don't say good evening again. I say good night to you and I say bye bye forever, forever. You see, that, that's how my mind is. That's how their heart is. And they say, I say good night there. Never will I say good evening again. If you see me there, that means I'm not the child of my father. Mm -hmm. The child of the father. Because it passes from Adam to this, to this, and then to the father, and then to the child. is going to pass it on. Because it is the nature. It is the nature. Look at that again. If I saw ye, they made their hearts as an adamant stone. Lest they should hear the law. And the words which the Lord of hosts has said in his spirit by the former prophets. Therefore came great, a great wrath from the Lord of hosts. It says, therefore, it, come, it, it is come to pass that as he cried and they would not hear. Adamant, stubborn, rebellious, resisting the word of God because of the corruption of the heart, the depravity of the heart, as he cried, as he called, as he spoke, as he proclaimed, as he pleaded, and they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, says the Lord of hosts. It has consequence, that kind of heart. In Second Chronicles chapter 36, Second Chronicles chapter 36, reading from verse 13. In Second Chronicles chapter 36, verse 13, uh, look at the condition of the heart of these people and the outward expression, what therefore came as a result of that corruption in the heart, that defilement of the heart, that depravity of the heart, and that adamant nature in the heart. It tells us in Second Chronicles chapter 36, Second Chronicles chapter 36, reading from verse 13. It says in verse 13, And he also rebelled against, the, against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened. What did he harden? And the heart was already bad. He hardened it. Already corrupt, had indeed. Already depraved, he had indeed. It's going from bad to worse. Had in the search from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed. How? Very much. The people that they just they do it, they take it like full time business. They do it like a full-time work, a full-time job, transgressing, transgressing against the Lord. The heart does not know any better condition. The heart does not have any upward leak or upward poor or upward look. It's just doing evil and evil and evil. And it says, uh, after all the abominations of the heathen, 
and polluted the house of the Lord which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their fathers said to them by the messengers, by his messengers rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his, on his dwelling place. But what did they do? They mocked the messengers of God. Talk about turning, they mocked. Talk about repentance, they mocked. Talk about praying, they mocked. Talk about returning to the Lord, calling upon the name of the Lord, they mocked. Talk about having a change of heart, they mocked his messengers, the messengers of God, and they despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of God arose against his people. Tell me. Tell me out aloud. Tell, there was no remedy. They just went on and on and on until they sank, until they were drowned, and there was no remedy. Uh, we see it uh, different in the New Testament. Uh, look, at, look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. Acts of the Apostles chapter 7. The condition of the heart that has not been saved. The heart that has not been cleansed. The heart that has not been transformed. The heart that Jesus Christ has not done any work of grace in. It tells us in Acts chapter 7 verse 51. It says she sipped nature and uncircumcised in her heart. That's the problem. That's the problem. The heart is still in the depraved condition, natural condition, corrupt condition, and it's in the evil condition. And it says she's the stiff neck and uncircumcised in heart and ears. Ye do, what's the next word? Always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. And so you find that people. Uh, who are thinking, I'll turn over a new leaf, I'll try by myself. No, you cannot, because the fountain is evil. What comes out of that fountain will be evil. The fountain is dirty. What comes out of that fountain will be dirty. And the fountain is polluted. What comes out of that fountain will be polluted. The fountain is corrupt and stinking. And what comes out of that fountain will be corrupt and stinking. In fact, Jesus said, what comes out of the heart, heart unconverted, Heart unsaved, heart unregenerated. In Mark chapter 7, Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 21, it says, For from within, out of the heart of men. You see, Jesus Christ gives us even the secret. He tells us why people are bad, why people are sinful, why people are evil. He says, it's in the origin of that heart. It's the very foundation of that heart. It's the very fountain of that life. It says in verse 21, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts. It comes from the heart. Adulteries, it comes from the heart. Fornications, it comes from the heart. Mourners, it comes from the heart. Thirds, coming from the heart. Covetousness, coming from the heart. And then he talks of wickedness coming from the heart. Deceit, coming from the heart. Lasciviousness from the heart. An evil eye, an evil eye. You know, whatever that means. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, somebody will look at you like this. You can see the evil coming out of the eyes, coming out of the, out of the inner being of that person because the heart is evil. And the fellow looks at you like this. If you are not born again uh, and you are given to, you know, fear and superstition, uh, you'll feel that you know, that's an evil eye. It's like, you know, something bad may happen because there's an evil eye. And that comes from the heart. And it says, blood blasphemy and pride and foolishness all these natural things what are they all these tell me out aloud evil things everything we're ready at their evil things they don't take people to heaven you can't get to heaven with all those things coming out of the heart if the heart is not cleansed if the heart is not put it says all these evil things come from within and they defile the man in ephesians chapter 4 ephesians chapter 4 we're reading from verse 18 ephesians chapter 4 reading from verse 18 it tells us in verse 18 it says having the understanding 
darkened. They don't understand. They can't understand. If the light is shining. They cannot see the light. The word of God is coming forth. They cannot understand, understand that word of God. They have the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God. They are separated from the life of God. You remember, Adam separated from the life of God. And sins was separated from the life of God. An evil nature came into him. His sinful nature was established and trenched in him. And then all the children that were being born, they were being born in that same condition that they're separated from the holiness of God, they're separated from the nature of God, they're separated from the likeness of God. And it says here that the being and the nature separated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of what? Of their heart. The problem is the heart. The problem is the heart. If you find yourself that you claim to be saved, you claim to be born again, you came to be a child of God, and yet sinful things are always coming up. I say, I don't know why. I can't help it. It's coming from the fountain. It's coming from the heart. If you find that violence is always coming out, I can't help it. If you find that anger is always coming out, I can't help it. If you find that dirty, dirty thoughts are always coming out, I, I can't help it. I find that you know this kind of life that doesn't uh, behold, that doesn't befit a Christian is coming out. I can't help it. It's because of the condition of the heart. Look at verse 19 who being past feeling. They don't even feel it now. No guilt, no condemnation, nothing at all because of the adamant nature of the heart. It says so being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all unrighteousness with what? Greediness. That is, it's like they're looking for righteousness. They want to practice on righteousness. They want a chance to be able to give expression to the depravity and to the corruption in the heart. It says the reason is because the heart is evil. And that's what the Lord is warning us in Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Reading there from verse 12. Hebrews chapter 3. Reading here from verse 12. It says in verse 12, Take heed, brethren. It's not talking to believers. It says you have been born again. Know the pit you are coming from. Know the condition you are coming from. And know the thing you are left behind. It says, Take heed, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. It tells us uh, very clearly that the condition of the heart that is not saved, the condition of the heart that has not been transformed, the condition of the heart that has not been regenerated is depraved, is corrupt, is evil, is sinful, it appears even helpless, as if the fellow is helpless, it cannot do otherwise. It says the condition of the heart, but now we come to point number two, which leads us to the point we now begin to realize something must be done. Something must happen. A change must come. A transformation shall come. And a cleansing must come. But first of all, there will be contrition of heart. There will be conviction. There are point number two, the decision of convicted contrite hearts. Point number two, the decision of convicted contrite hearts. You see, what the Lord is actually expecting is that man will come to realization. And that realization will bring a contrition in the heart, will bring sorrow of heart. How could I have been like that? How could I have remained like that? How was my heart like that? And how could I have done this and said this and gone there and drunk that and taken that? When that contrition comes, when that sorrow of heart comes, it drives on your knees and God says, that's what he's waiting for and that is what he's looking for. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57. And we're reading from verse 15. Isaiah Chapter 57, verse uh, 15. In verse 15 it says, For thus says the high and the lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy, and dwell in the high and holy place, with him also that is of a, what kind of heart? Contrite and humble spirit, 
to revive the uh, to revive the spirit of the humble and to and, and to revive the heart of the contrite ones that tells us then the contrition is very important when you see the condition of your life and the way you'll be living that life this is not pleasing to god god is a holy god god is a righteous god god is a good god and god is a god who expects that those who serve him will follow after righteousness but you see you've been going to church you see you've been reading the bible you see you You've been calling yourself religious, but the heart was still in the original condition, depraved and uh, dirty and uh, corrupt and debauched. Then you come to the Lord in real contrition, and God says, that's exactly what he's looking for, and that's what he's looking at. You cannot just come to God and say, hello God, good morning Jesus, I come to see you today. And isn't it wonderful I'm coming? I want to see, they talk about salvation, they talk about conversion, they talk about eternal life. Can I have that eternal life? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I got it. No. No contrition. No sorrow of heart. No sorrow for your sin. And then you just say, I'm all right, I'm all right. And then you're, you're acting familiar with the Almighty God. He says, no, that's not out of salvation. It's not just to say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Raise up your hand, I raise up my hand. Now I'm saved. No, we don't get saved that way. There's contrition of heart. There's conviction for your sin. And then there's confession. You go to God in prayer. And then you confess that and you're promising the Lord, Lord you saved me out of this. Never will I go back to that again. Look at Isaiah chapter 66. I'm reading from verse 2. Isaiah chapter 66. We're reading from verse 2. For all those things as mine handmaid and all those things have been, says the Lord, but to this man, here is God talking, but to this man, only this kind of man, but to this man will I look, even to him that is poor and of a contrite spirit, and trembleth at my word. Of a contrite spirit, you hear the word of judgment, you tremble. You hear what God says is going to do against all sinners in any church, in any denomination, and you tremble. He says to this man, will I look, the people that have contrite hearts. We're looking at Psalm 34. Psalm 34, I'm reading from verse 18. Psalm 34, verse 18. It says, The Lord is nice unto them that of a broken heart and save as such as of a contrite spirit. So don't let us make a salvation cheap. Salvation is not cheap. Forgiveness is not cheap. Grace of God, the grace of God is not cheap. And the love of God is not cheap. And conversion experience is not cheap. Calvary is not cheap. And what Christ has done is not cheap. It's not just come, come, come. Everybody come. Well, come with your sin. Come with your load. Come with whatever. God doesn't mind at all. How could you say that a holy God, a righteous God, does not mind that you are believing in sin? He says, no. If God is going to save, if God is going to to forgive, it says the Lord is near unto them that of a broken heart and save a sword of a contrite spirit. We're looking at Psalm 51. In Psalm 51, I'm reading from verse, uh, verse 17. Psalm 51, verse 17. The sacrifices of God are a, uh, are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God. Thou wilt not despise. The psalmist recognized that. David recognized that. And that's why he came uh, praying this prayer unto God. He had been a favored man of God. He had been a king. The spirit of God was upon him. And through that power of the spirit of God, he had killed Goliath. And eventually became a king. You know his story. And how he did this atrocious sin. He committed adultery. Committed murder. And then took that woman to himself. And he says, and God was displeased with what, God, with what um, David had done. And now he's coming to God. What did he realize? Realize the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. And then a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Look at his prayer. Look at verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God. 
according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. David here was saying, Lord, I know myself now. I'm convicted. I'm a transgressor. I've done evil. You see, these are not the people coming to God and saying, God, well, I made that mistake. They're calling sin a mistake. Lord, I misjudged the situation. They're calling iniquity, misjudging the situation. They say, oh God, you know, everybody has his fault, and here is my peculiarity, here is my fault. No, not at all. David said, I'm a transgressor. Look at verse 2, wash me thoroughly. From my iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. You see the languages, you see, there's a contrite man, there's a convicted man. He says, my sin. It says, my iniquity. It says, my transgression. For I acknowledge, acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. I can see the picture when I stretch my hand towards that woman. I could see my picture when I drew that woman to myself. I could see my picture when I wrote that letter to Job. I could see the picture. Everything is fresh before me. It is a man that had real conviction. And if you're going to be forgiven, if you're going to be changed, if your heart is going to be transformed, this contrition, conviction is necessary against thee and thee only. Have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight? that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest behold I was shapen in iniquity he said I, I know my problem I know the source of my problem even from birth I knew that I had this depravity in my heart and he says in sin did my mother conceive me behold thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom purge me purge me purge me with Esau and I shall be clean and wash me and I shall be whiter than snow there's nothing I can do for myself I cannot reach out to my heart and cleanse my heart myself I cannot reach out to the very source of the evil and then make myself all right it says make me hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities creating me a clean heart my heart is unclean, creating me a clean heart. My heart is corrupt, creating me a clean heart. My heart is depraved, creating me a clean heart. O oh God, renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not the Holy Spirit from me. Restore, restore, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. I used to feel it. I used to know it. I used to sense it. The joy of salvation, the delight in salvation, and the happiness happiness and salvation and I'll go about as if there was no problem in the world but now all that joy is gone all that reality is gone restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit then will I teach transgressors I cannot teach now a transgressor cannot teach another transgressor I cannot teach now iniquities in my life I cannot tell other people to be free from that iniquity I cannot teach now I'm a sinner and a sinner cannot teach another sinner but save me forgive me restore me change me transform my life only then when that has taken place will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee deliver me from bloody from blood guiltiness I'm feeling guilty of my involvement in the death of that man I'm feeling guilty in my involvement as I wrote the letter and I used the sword of the people uh, over there on the battlefield to kill that man I feel guilty about that and it says deliver me from blood guiltiness O God thou God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing I cannot sing now I cannot sing now because iniquity is there because transgression is there but when you cleanse me and when you deliver me and when you save me when you restore to me the joy of your salvation then my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness O Lord, O Lord open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise for thou desirest not sacrifice else I would give it thou desirest not burnt offering it was then he said the 
sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O oh God, thou wilt not despise. You see what it takes if somebody is going to have real salvation, if somebody is going to have real forgiveness, there must be contrition, there must be the confession. We're coming to Joel. Joel, I'm reading from chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, and I'm reading here from verse 12. Joel chapter 2, we're reading from verse 12. Here it tells us in verse 12, you see the condition of the heart. If we're really going to have fellowship with God, relationship with God, it says, therefore also now, says the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart. Turn to me with all your heart and with fasting and with weeping and with mourning. You know, there are people that tell us that, you know, when you come to the house of God, everything is joy, 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 joy. To those who are backsliding, joy, joy, joy. And to those who do not know the Lord, joy, joy, joy. To those whose names are not written in the book of life in heaven, joy, joy, joy. They say, the joy of the Lord. They say, cheer up. Hi, about all you people, the way you are be joyful and dance to the Lord because you have something to rejoice about. We slept last night and then we woke up this morning and then He's giving us clothes. He bought us our bread and He sugars our tea and everything is wonderful and He has provided for us. Our children are going to school and this is happening, that is happening there for everybody. Now don't let me see any morose a person there and somebody dropping the head. I said, you know, everybody must cheer up. God didn't say that. God didn't say that. Look at what he's saying. He says, therefore also now, says the Lord, turn ye even to me with all your heart, and with fasting, and with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your heart, and not your garment. You see that? Rend your heart. Let there be contrition in the heart, sorrow in the heart, because you've gone astray, and you've gone away from the Lord, and turn to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repenteth him of the evil. If they did that, what will be the consequence? Look at verse 32. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. It says there will be deliverance, there will be salvation. If there is that contrition, if there is that confession, if there is that sorrow of heart because of the evil that you have done. It tells us in Ezekiel chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18, I'm reading from verse 13. Ezekiel chapter 18 and we're reading from verse 30. Here the Lord is uh, making us to understand uh, what we need to do, what a sinner needs to do so that he can come to the Lord. Ezekiel 18 verse 30. It says, therefore I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. And if you want to escape that judgment, what do you do? Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions. Turn yourselves from not just some of the transgressions. That one is so sweet, I cannot leave it now. That one is so attached to me, I cannot leave that now. That one brings gain and profit. I cannot live it. Now. No, you cannot be saved now. You cannot be saved by just confessing some few sins. You don't understand what sin is. You don't understand what, how God looks at that sin, whatever sin. And he says in that verse 30, second part, repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions so iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away. From, from you. All your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you what kind of heart? Tell me out aloud. In your heart. A heart that is not, you know, excusing evil, rejoicing in evil, covering evil, enjoying evil, delighting in evil, secretly embracing evil. It says, make you in your heart. It says, and a new spirit. But why will ye die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourself and leave ye. I pray every one of us will live. 
when this conviction comes look at look at acts of the apostles that's how they got saved acts of the apostles we're looking at chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 37 acts of the apostles chapter 2 verse 37 it says in verse 37 now when they heard this they were preach in their heart you see that there's that contrition there's that conviction they heard the word of god you've gone astray you've not done right and you killed the lord jesus christ the prince of life and you rejected the christ the anointed of god and when they heard that it says they were preach in their heart and they said unto peter and to the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do what shall we do that conviction will make you to realize you need to do something and there are people that will you know tell us uh, you know as you read uh, if you are reading their books at all and if you are listening to them many times you might overhear them they say there's nothing you do that when you say what shall we do to be saved there's nothing to do christ has done everything you just come now pleasurely and come you know as you come you come into the grace of god and you come to the kingdom of god the bible didn't say that christ didn't say that the apostles didn't say that what did they say look at verse 30 then peter said unto them what repent you must turn and with all your heart all your soul all your mind and you come to the lord that's salvation but the one that will just say no confession of sin no repentance from sin and there is uh, no hatred for the sin and there's no sorrow for the sin we just come i'm saved i'm saved uh -uh. if you're really saved you will hate the sins of the past life and you will want to go to the lord to say lord i need your grace i must not go back to that thing iniquity transgression sin i must not go to them at all it says repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of jesus christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the, uh, the gift of the holy ghost look at verse 40 and with many other words did he testify and exhort saying save yourselves from this unto what generation and then it says and they that gladly received this word he didn't say repentance what's all it was that about they didn't say uh, save yourself from this a wicked generation what about that and get on your knees and confess your sin they didn't say what about that? they accepted that joyfully they said that's what you are looking for that's what you are waiting for they gladly received this word they were baptized and the same day they were added unto them about three thousand souls and they continued some people will continue when they have repented they will continue when they have been cleansed they'll continue when the grace of god has come into them they'll continue it will not be difficult to follow up on them because there's genuine confession there's genuine conversion it came out of the contrition of heart it came out of uh, the condemnation of their sin and it came out from the conviction that they have got and it says when they came to the lord they continue steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in and in prayers look at verse 47 praising god and uh, having favor with all the people and the lord what did he do added to the church added to, when there's real evangelism there'll be addition to the church but you know when we just say come to jesus come to jesus if you come to jesus he will heal you if you come to jesus he will bless you he will come to jesus he'll give you success how about uh, the sins of the past uh -uh, don't discourage them and don't uh, make them not to come 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 are you ready to pray with me now say after me and uh, jesus jesus i come to you now i come to you now thank you for what you've done for me thank you for what you've done for me i know you died for me i know you died for me and i know you want to save me now i know you want to save me now and i come and i come and then thank you you have received me you have received me in jesus name amen and then after you want to follow up the people they're back in the jungle of sin they're back in all their evil practices because there's no contrition there was no conviction and there's no conversion it just mere confession that meant nothing to them and nothing to the kingdom of god but for the people who have who have been asking what shall we do we feel guilty what shall we do we feel condemned what shall we do we feel that we feel convicted of our sins what shall we do repent and then they repented then the lord added 
them to the church such as shall be saved. I pray that our preaching will be faithful to the word in Jesus' name. Amen. We're, looking at, uh, we're looking at the word of God in uh, Romans, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, when that genuine conversion has taken place, it is not the preacher that will tell them, now you are saved, now you are saved. Uh-uh, you are not the one to tell them. The Holy Ghost will tell them. In Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. It says, for as many, as many as are led of the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. The Spirit take over their lives when they are converted. And the Word of God, the very precious to them it says for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry Abba Father the spirit itself bear it witness with our spirit that what that were the children of God. Uh, that, that, that's what happens because there's been real conviction. There's real contrition. And these people have really come to the Lord. Christ makes a difference in the life of that sinner. Now he's born again. Christ makes a difference in the life of that backslider. Now he's born again and restored. The experience of salvation is real. And the Holy Ghost is bearing witness to that. that that salvation we're talking about includes a number of things. Number one, it includes forgiveness. Salvation, it includes conversion. Salvation, it includes peace of mind. Salvation, it includes justification. And the Lord is looking at him now as if, as if he had never said that salvation includes regeneration. There is a new life that is created within him. And there's eternal life, there's transformation and change of heart. This change of heart is the beginning of the divine operation in the heart of man. Not the end is the beginning and not the end. There is still more to be done in the heart of this person that has not come to the Lord. That brings us to point number three. The destiny of cleansed, circumcised hearts. Remember, there's conversion now. There's salvation now. There's regeneration now. There's a new life now. All things have passed away. All things have become new. But we still need to understand there's that inward depravity. There's that inbred sin. There's that nature that the person brought into this world. Although he can now say, my Lord, my God. And God can say, I am your Lord, I am your God. Yet there's something God wants to do for him and God wants to do in him. The destiny of clean, circumcised hearts. We're coming to Deuteronomy chapter 30. Deuteronomy chapter 30, and I'm reading from verse 6. It says, And the Lord thy God, these are not sinners, these are not Egyptians, these are people that God himself is claiming that they belong to him. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord uh, thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, that thou mayest live. You, you remember when somebody came to the Lord Jesus Christ and said what's the greatest commandment in the law and Jesus said the first and the greatest commandment is this that shall love the Lord with all your heart all your soul and all your mind and all your strength and then you love your neighbor as yourself uh, but you see you cannot do that without this circumcision even though God had given up the command he knows that the man is uh, perennially and completely weak that he cannot love the Lord with all the heart, all the soul, all the mind, and all the strength. He has to do something to the heart. That's why it says, The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed, so that you'll be able to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. What God said he will do in the Old Testament, he will circumcise your heart. Look at the response in Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, we're reading from verse 29. Romans chapter 2, verse 29. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. 
Notice that again, inwardly, it's not just the outward religion, outward righteousness, outward behavior, external correctness. It says, for he is a Jew, which is one inwardly, and circumcision is so that of the heart, in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And so you see what he said he will do. He will circumcise your heart. Is in chapter 30? He tells us now in uh, Romans chapter uh, Romans chapter 2 that yes, God will do it. And then God will be pleased with that. Look at Romans chapter 6, verse 6. Romans chapter 6. Read it here from verse 6. It says in verse 6, knowing this. That your old man is crucified with him. That's the nature, the Adamic nature. The old man is crucified with him. That's the depravity of the heart. That's the nucleus of sin. Then it says, so that the body of sin might be covered up. What will be done? destroyed. What does that mean, the body of sin? You see, the germ, the seed of sin that is in the soil. Whatever you do on the soil, even if you cut the tree, and you cut it down, all the branches are off, all the fruits are off, but the seed is still there, the root is still there, and what God says is that he will uproot it, he will destroy it, and that place will be totally free. And then the Holy Ghost will come, at the baptism in the Holy Ghost and fill up that place, so he says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him that the body of sin might be destroyed that henceforth we should not serve sin let's come back to the old testament we're looking at uh, psalm 24 psalm 24 we're reading from verses 3 and 4 Psalm 24, verses 3 and 4, it says, Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? And all who shall stand in his holy place? He that has, tell me, clean hands and watch and a pure heart. Clean hands, that's salvation. That's how to watch. You see, clean hands, alcohol is gone, cigarette is gone, fighting is gone, violence is gone, adultery is gone, fornication is gone, all those external things, they are gone clean hands, but now a pure heart, a pure heart. The heart must still be circumcised. The heart must still be cleansed. The heart must still be purged. The heart must still be purified. Clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity and no sworn deceitfully. That verse 4 pure heart. Let's come to the New Testament and see the confirmation. In the New Testament, we're reading from Matthew chapter 5 and we're looking at verse 8. It says, for us to get to heaven, for us to dwell with God in eternity, it says clean hands are not enough. I don't do this, I don't do that, that's not enough. I'm clean, I'm clear, I'm, I'm alright uh, externally. It says that that's not enough. There must be pure heart. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. What will happen? For they shall see God. For you to see God fully here and to see God in heaven, there must be purity of heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. How will that happen? How will that happen? We're looking in Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. Acts of the Apostles chapter 15. And here we're reading from verse 9. Acts chapter 15. We're reading from verse 9. It tells us in verse 9, and put no difference. What was he saying here? Peter is saying, uh, Cornelius a Gentile and we Jews, God has not put any difference. The same promise he made to the Jews, the same promise he's making to the Gentiles. And he puts no difference between us and them, between us Jews and them Gentiles. And, them Gentiles. and he says, purifying their hearts. How? My faith that you used to come to God. Now, when you come, you are coming for sanctification. You are coming for purity of heart. You are not coming like you came for salvation. Let me explain. When you came for salvation, you felt guilty. You felt condemned. And you felt the contrition of heart. You felt the conviction in your heart. And you confess my sin, my transgression, my iniquity, my evil deeds, my wrongdoing. Lord, forgive me. But now... That's not there. All that you are coming to now, you are coming to God for, is that you want this Adamic nature to be dealt with. 
You're not really responsible for that. You inherited that. It's like my black skin. My black skin, I'm not responsible for that. But mommy and daddy, they're Africans. Therefore, I'm born African. The same thing with you. What we got from our parents, the Adamic nature, that's what you are coming to God for. And we're saying, this one, I inherited this. But I want to love you with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my strength. I want to love you without any reservation. I want to love you without any rival. I want to give myself fully, completely unto you without any comparison, competition with any other person. I want to love you perpetually, totally, permanently. I want all my heart, everything. I want it to belong to you. We call that consecration. We're laying ourselves on the altar. We're saying, Lord, I could really go far if I didn't have this Adamic nature. I could love you more if I didn't have this in the privity of heart. I could love you more. I could do things for you and then my purpose will be pure and my intention will be genuine everything will be transparent if I could get rid of all this therefore I lay everything before you as a person will give himself to the surgeon and say go ahead and operate and I surrender everything in my body for you for the operation so I'm surrendering my heart unto you so that this operation will take place and then I believe I believe because it says purify their hearts by, by faith and I pray it will happen I said, I pray it will happen. And when it happens, you will know because the evidence is there. You are loving the Lord. There's no competition. There's no comparison. There's no rival. You're loving the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. We're coming back to the Old Testament, and we're looking at a Jeremiah chapter 31. Jeremiah chapter 31, and I'm reading from verse 33. Jeremiah chapter 31 and we're reading from verse 33. Look at what the Lord is saying here now. You see what we've been doing? We've been reading Old Testament and the New Testament fulfillment. Old Testament and the New Testament operation. Old Testament and the New Testament fulfillment and the experience. We're now in Jeremiah chapter 31 and I'm reading from verse 33. Look at this. But it says but they shall be the covenant that I will make make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will not, he says I will put my law in their inward parts and write it, what is he going to write it? in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. You see what it says in the Old Testament? It says, I'm going to do something. I'll circumcise your heart all right and then you'll love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your mind and then the law of God will not be in the stone, in the ark that you cannot have access to. I'm going to bring that law. I'm going to bring it into your heart. I will write it myself. As I wrote it on the tables of stone, I'm going to write it now on your heart. Look at the fulfillment. We're looking at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 8 and I'm reading from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8 and we're reading from verse 10. That's what he had told them in the Old Testament and now when Christ came and Christ died and made the sacrifice now it is being fulfilled. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 10 it says for this is the covenant that I will make of the house of Israel after those days says the Lord I will put my Lord laws into their mind and write each where in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people so he fulfills each in the New Testament let's come back to Jeremiah I'm reading from chapter 32 Jeremiah chapter 32 we're reading from verse 39 Jeremiah chapter 32 verse 39 I want you to notice something here in verse 39 it says in verse 39 and I will give them what kind of heart one heart one way do you remember what Jesus said when he prayed for our sanctification that they may be one the father in me and I in them that they may all be one in us sanctification makes us one one with the father one with the son and one with the Holy Ghost and one with the scriptures the word of God and one with the people of God who are sanctified it says in this uh, verse 39 and I will give them one heart and one way that they may fear me forever for the it says uh, for the uh, for the good of them uh, and of their children after them look at this look at this verse 40 and I will make with them what kind of covenant tell me out aloud 
everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn from them uh, to do them good that I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. What kind of covenant again? Everlasting covenant. Come to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 13. And we're looking at the fulfillment now. Hebrews chapter 13. I'm reading from verses 20 and 21. Hebrews 13. Reading from verses 30, 20 and 21. Now the God of peace uh, that, uh, that brought again from the dead at Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the, tell me, everlasting covenant you see it, it tells us the old testament and the people to really get into the experience because christ has now come look at verse uh, look at verse 21 make you perfect that's the sanctification there in every good work to do his will uh, well, to do his will walking in you that which is well pleasing in his sight through jesus christ to whom the glory forever and ever amen. amen the lord will do it amen. the lord can do it amen. if you can do it why will he not do it if we come to him the right way he sanctifies and when you are sanctified the fire of god will come in your soul it will burn off that adamic nature in jesus name amen. Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 9, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor. And it says that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for how many people? He tasted death for me. I said he tasted death for me. I said it tasted death for me. It's for me now to come to Christ and say, everything you did for me, when you died that, that, that death, I want to experience that. Look at this, look at verse 10. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to where? To glory. Where is he taking you to? I said, where is he taking you to? And uh, he, he saved you. And then that's one step. And now he sanctifies you. And he's saying, I'm going to uphold your hand. And I make an everlasting covenant with you. And you will not go back. Amen. Somebody there, I said, you will not go back. Amen. Because he's going to bring you to glory. To make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Look at verse 11. For, for uh, both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified. Both he that sanctified and they who are what? Sanctified. That was sanctified there. They say in the, in the Greek, you don't understand Greek, don't worry. But they say in the Greek, it's in the hourish tense. That is something established, something done, something finalized, something you have experienced. And it is there. Even in the English language, it's very clear. They who are sanctified, they are not being sanctified slowly, gradually. And then one day when they are about to die, death will consume, they will complete the sanctification no they're already sanctified they who are sanctified are all of one for which cause is not ashamed to call them brethren thank god we're brethren the brethren of the lord jesus christ he cleanses our hearts he purges our hearts he purifies our hearts but we have something to do hebrews chapter 13 hebrews chapter 13 and i'm reading from verse 12 wherefore jesus also that he might sanctify the people with what with his own blood suffered without the gate. Let us go forth therefore unto him without the camp bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. We're seeking that heavenly place. And we're going to be there. You are going to be there. You spend eternity with the angels of God in heaven, with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with Peter, with John, with all those uh, great men of God who have gone. You will see Enoch. You will see Elijah. You see all those faithful people of God and the people we have read about and the people who have helped us that we have read about will see them face to face and more than that, we'll see the face of the Lord Jesus Christ and we'll see the Almighty God Himself. But remember, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I want to see Him. 
I said I want to see him. I said I want to see him. It's going to take the heart being purged and purified and being circumcised and being cleansed. He can do it. If he has done it before, he can renew it again. I said he can renew it again. And then with the very fingers of God, he'll write his word in your heart. Let him do something for you tonight. Rise up and tell the Lord, do something for me tonight. Do something for me tonight. Do something for me tonight. My heart, my heart, my heart. I want this heart to come back to Calvary. I want this heart to be cleansed and to be poured and to be purified and to be circumcised all over again. Lord, I want my heart to love you. I want to love you with all my heart, all my my soul and all my strength. He will do it. He will do it. You call upon the Lord. Make sure you're serious about it. He will do something unforgettable in your Christian experience.